Of course, that didn't cause the revolution. Nor did the self-emulation of one individual. Nor did particular social and economic grievances that had been going on for a very long time. It ended up being what happened in Eastern Europe, what happens elsewhere, when you get a certain level of educated people who have a sense of political consciousness and are aware about their, both their internal surroundings, their regional surroundings, their global surroundings, that they simply had enough. And I guess one way, and, and, and I, I know some of this sounds a bit abstract, and, and we'd like to always get very concrete, empirically verified explanations, but this notion of losing the sense of fear is not an abstract exist existential concept. Giving you the example of those taxi drivers. Yes, Tunisians were fearful that, you know, they were being followed, they were going to be beat up, their family was going to be, you know, uh, monitored or taken to jail or called in by the police and so on and so forth. The loss of fear was sufficient to mobilize individuals who were now willing to die. I'm not going to Europe, I'm not joining Al-Qaeda, I'm not being co-opted, and I'm not going home shutting up and listening to your silly TV programs or more Ben Ali nonsense. That's something I think, you know, it's hard to explain beyond this particular notion. Now, you know, it's interesting because in our own Western experience, the United States, we have no problem about invoking freedom and and liberty, and justice, and constitutionalism, and the American Revolution, all kinds of, you know, in some ways very abstract concepts, uh, but which we deeply believe in, and which ultimately uh, were concretized through particular institutions and documents, which then leads me to, to the next stage, uh, and where the pitfalls might lie. Um, so essentially, what, I was what I've been describing is uh, a movement that had a, a, a number of distinctive, if not unique, features. One, of course, was the obvious youth of the movement, but also, of course, very obvious was the fact that it was men and women. Uh, the women went back in the kitchen. They were up there with, with the men uh, demonstrating. Uh, the idea that the military decided not to, not to act, very crucial in a, in a tactical way, uh, for sure. Uh, of course, we talked about Facebook and, and Twitter and, and so forth. N none of these by themselves, of course, are sufficient as explanations, but in combination they clearly uh, demonstrate something important. What's also interesting is there was no particular ideology or organization. You now hear, for example, the notion, well, you know, you really can't have a movement with that's not organized and that has no leadership and no ideology. But they did have organization. They did have ideology and they did have leadership. The only difference is it's virtual. It's on Twitter. You don't need to have a meeting like this to get everybody to meet at a certain point. You'll just Facebook everybody. They'll all be out there. And so when people are saying, oh, they're not organized, they're better organized. You can get more people to a meeting now than you could ever if you depended on leaflets, word of mouth, telephone calls, and so on and so forth. And we also saw these young dudes, they are damn well organized. They're amazing. You want to hire these. You know how, how we take for granted all the CEOs, CEOs, you know, oh, Google, he's only like, you know, I don't know, 30, and you know, Facebook, he's only 26, and, and so on and so on. And yet, here we're looking at Egypt and Tunisia, you know, oh, they're too young, you know, uh, they don't know, they don't have organization, they don't have ideology, and so on and so forth. I think what is among, for me, one of the larger lessons of this whole experience is the degree to which increasingly we need to look at this part of the world, no longer in this exceptional context, that somehow Arabs and Muslims are, you know, operate according to different standards, different values, different modes of thinking, and so on and so forth. Not only must we not look at them that way, but in fact we can learn from them. We can learn from them in many ways, uh, is one larger lesson that I, uh, I would take from that. So you went from protest to resistance to a, a revolution. And in the case of Tunisia and Egypt, of course, uh, they, they, they have succeeded to overthrow the dictator. Now, that's the first stage. But listen, you know, people already are, you, you've heard this all over the place. They're jumping all over this thing. Ah, oh, the Muslim Brotherhood is going to win. Oh, there's chaos. Oh, there's violence. And so Guys, it's only been like two months. I mean, how could they be jumping all over them saying how oh, they haven't gotten their act together, you know, you can't trust them, uh, da, 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 da. It's only been two months. Give them a chance. 
they've been under dictatorial rule for decades, for decades. If you had been in that situation and you got to this stage, which is an amazing stage to get at, I think we still need to sit back and appreciate the enormity of what has just happened before we get overly critical about what will happen next. To be sure, we need now to take a more, let's say, sober and, uh, view of, of, of the future. Um, and here, um, I, I'm fairly optimistic when it comes to Tunisia. Egypt, I'll put a, maybe a question mark or two. Still optimistic, maybe not as optimistic. And for the same reasons that I've explained why the Tunisian civil society ultimately decided to act against the dictatorship, I think it's that same level of political consciousness. Remember, this is a society that's socially cohesive, that's very educated, that uh, has a you know, good understanding of the world, and so forth, that I believe that they will get their act together. They, you, know, you have to go back, go back to Tunisian history. It was the young Tunisians, like the young Turks, who began the internal process of modernizing Tunisia before the French ever got there, okay? French got there in 1882, but already the Tunisians themselves began the internal process of reforming and modernizing, adapting Islam to the modern world. So the Tunisians didn't have to be shown back in the 19th century. By the time you get to the 20th century, the Tunisians are, are already well underway in developing a sense of identity, a sense of social consciousness, uh, a certain sense of political consciousness. Uh, and in a way, that process was diverted by these uh, uh, egomaniacs, uh, effectively, uh, what Bourguiba ended up being and, and Ben Ali. Uh, so uh, given that history, I have a certain amount of faith that the Tunisians have the capacity to create the necessary institutions, including constitutions, electoral laws, uh, multi-party systems, uh, that will see the beginning of an emerging competitive democracy. Now, will this democracy incorporate the Islamic point of view? Absolutely. Should it? If the Tunisians want it, you bet. Uh, is it going to be uh, peaceful and accepting of the rules of the game? I'm convinced yes. I'm convinced yes. And indeed, it could be argued that to the extent to which uh, movement like al Nahda and maybe other Islamist parties uh, are integrated within the political system, the more moderate they'll behave because with responsibility and accountability uh, and in a system where elections matter, uh, you're essentially being judged on performance, not just on ideology. Uh, so on the basis that I believe that, a, uh, and hear the argument in the academic circles, do you need a democratic culture prior to a a, a institutional or democratic, you know, do, do you need a, a democratic culture before you have a democratic institutions, or do you need democratic institutions that create a democratic culture? And I, and I don't think you can answer that easily. If you, if you argue that you need a democratic culture to make democratic institutions viable, then you could put that thing off forever. So my sense is, as elsewhere in, in the world where transitions have taken place, democratic institutions can serve as the uh, arena of socialization to a democratic culture that from which then other attributes of democracy that we are more familiar with under liberal democracy will make themselves felt. So let's not jump the gun on saying and start ticking off every aspect of liberal democracy that we have in the West and if we don't see that happening in Tunisia then there's a fundamental flaw. I think uh, the basic institutions of de democratic expression need to exist and that, of, co of course, basically is with participation and, and contestation uh, and then the various uh, instruments that uh, allow the expression of the different political opinions. If that gets into place, if the Constitution is, is valid and, and, and legitimate, I think Tunisia has a, has a great uh, uh, possibility for the future. Uh, I, I think Egypt is a much more complicated, but still very much possible because you're again dealing with uh, though much, there are much greater gaps between rich and poor, not as large a middle class, uh, but a homogenous society, sophisticated society. You go back studying Egypt of the 1920s and 30s, I mean, this is one of the most sophisticated, especially in Cairo and Alexandria, but that's a whole other issue altogether. I think what I'd like to do is, um, is uh, use maybe the rest of the time more because it's like the role of the U.S. is an important issue uh, and maybe the incorporation of uh, the examples of what's going on in Libya, what's going on in Yemen, what's going on in Bahrain and so forth. 
uh, why don't I use that as an occasion for maybe the question and answer period or the comments, uh, and let me just stop my formal uh, presentation now. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I'll take uh, questions or comments. Okay, this one, yeah. Thank you for your talk. Uh, actually, I actually was really curious about the very last bit you said about the U.S. involvement. Um, yes. we're well f most of us are familiar with U.S. involvement with Egypt. I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about U.S. involvement with the Tunisian regime, right. former Tunisian sure. regime. Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, now, Tunisia has never been a significant factor in American geostrategic interest in the Middle East and North Africa for a whole bunch of obvious reasons. It doesn't have oil. Uh, it doesn't have any other resource of any significance. We don't have very large uh, investments in, in the country. On the other hand, both under Bourguiba and Ben Ali, it's always put itself forward as moderate, as willing to make peace with Israel, at least under Bourguiba and not so much under Ben Ali, uh, as uh, during the days of Nasser, uh, Bourguiba presented himself as he was among the, among the first Arabs, for example, who said back in the 50s where we should make peace with Israel, which was revolutionary at the time that somebody was saying that. Uh, so I think uh, uh, Tunisia was favored by the U.S. mainly for its position on foreign affairs, on the question of Israel, on its, uh, during, the, during the Cold War, it would basically, you know, uh, at the U.N., be supportive of U.S. interests. Um, was obviously a, you know, uh, an, an important tourist destination for many Europeans. It succeeded in projecting a certain image that seemed moderate, pro-Western, friendly for investment, uh, and you know, not a hardliner on the Arab-Israeli question. And when it, comes to when, it comes to when it came to terrorism, they were more than happy to put themselves forward as, we will stop terrorists. Uh, the only problem is, you know, they define who was a terrorist, and that could be anybody that opposed them. Uh, so we ended up being on the wrong side there, uh, but we really had no choice, it seemed. I mean, I, I, I've, I've, I've argued over the years that a, a security, military-oriented foreign policy based on fighting terrorism, de when you're dealing with authoritarian regimes, is totally counterproductive. You neither get intelligence, nor do you get security because these regimes don't even cooperate with each other, nothing to say with us, when the Moroccans and the Algerians are fighting over the Western Sahara, and, we're exp and we think they're going to give us intelligence that we find useful in fighting terrorism, when they're, they're worried we're going to give it to the Moroccans, who are then going to use it against the Algerians, and, and so on. So unfortunately, since September 11th in particular, uh, our foreign policy in Tunisia has excessively been focused on security matters and, and the war on, on, on terrorism. But and you know from WikiLeaks, for those of you who have who, who've read the ones on Tunisia, diplomat after diplomat had been saying over the years, crony capitalism, this family is rotten to the core, people hate them, they make fun of them, they're dangerous, they're corrupt. I mean, the list went on and on. It was delightful to see the, the, this, you know, because, you know, academics knew that, but we always thought Washington, you know, they're clueless. Are you, don't you see what this guy is? And then you read these cables. But then that's, that I found even doubly frustrating. You mean they knew and they still continue these policies? That was, I, I, wish, I, wish the poli I wish those WikiLeaks had said, you know, no, he's a good guy. Then it's said, okay, they're stupid publicly and they're stupid privately. But when you see privately that they really knew what these guys were about and they still pursue these policies, which I feel bad for foreign service officers, you know, who probably do all this work, get really in the know, know the whole thing, and realize that nobody's paying attention to any of this. We're going to pursue policy the other way. And I'm not being overly cynical here, or, or, but this, this is really the case.